Hello, in this video I'd like to talk about inverting matrices. Uh, there's a wide variety of ways of inverting matrices, and whenever you're dealing with a problem it's always useful to have a wide array of tools in your toolbox. Whether it's as simple a problem as calculating the inverse of a matrix, or you're dealing with some more advanced problem involving inverse matrices, it's always useful to have lots of different ways of approaching the problem, and then you can figure out which one works best for you for this particular problem. So possibly the most common way of inverting matrices is using Gaussian elimination. So the idea here is that, uh, is suppose that we're trying to fully row reduce a square invertible matrix. So we apply a series of elementary uh, row operations to that matrix. And in the end, we're going to get a square invertible matrix in reduced row echelon form. Well, there's only one square invertible matrix in reduced row echelon form, and that's the identity matrix. So what we're actually doing here is we're starting off with a matrix M, and we're applying our series of elementary row operations. And as a result, we wind up getting the identity matrix. And these elementary row operations aren't just operations on matrices or vectors. They're matrices in and of themselves. And if we want to find out what the matrix is for doing a particular row operation, all we need to do is apply that row operation to the identity matrix, like this. So for instance, if we want to know what the uh, matrix is corresponding to the row operation that adds uh, twice row one to row two, all we need to do is start with the identity matrix and add twice row one to row two. And that's it. That gives us a matrix corresponding to the elementary row operation. Um, and we can multiply that matrix by another matrix to apply that row operation to that matrix. Or we can multiply it by a vector to apply that row operation to that vector. So, what we have here is actually a matrix product. We have that the product of all of these matrices here gives us the identity matrix. And by associativity, we can view this as this matrix here, the product of these elementary matrices times M is equal to the identity matrix. Well, this is exactly what we're looking for. This is the inverse matrix of M. So how can we actually figure out what this inverse matrix is? Uh, do we have to multiply all of these elementary matrices together? Uh, there's actually a clever trick for uh, doing this calculation, which is simply to apply these elementary row operations to the identity matrix while you're applying them to M. Because when we do this calculation, we wind up getting the product of each of these elementary matrices. So this here, this calculation here, is going to give us the inverse of our original matrix M. Let's try out an example. Suppose that we want to invert the matrix 1, 4, 0, 1, 0, 7, 0, negative 1, 0. So what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to apply uh, our row operations to get this into fully uh, reduced row echelon form, uh, and at the same time apply those same row operations to the identity matrix. So our first step, we're going to want to get rid of this one here. We're going to use row one to cancel that out. And we apply this row operation here to both of our matrices. Um, I'm actually going to do a clever thing this third row here looks like the kind of thing that we'd actually like to have in the second row, so I'm just going to swap them. And I'm going to do the same thing to this matrix over here. And I'm going to finish uh, row reducing. And so what we get here is we get the identity matrix on the left. We've applied all of our row reduction operations to turn our original matrix into the identity matrix. And those same operations turn the identity matrix uh, into 
the, uh, into the inverse of our original matrix. So this here is the inverse of our original matrix, and this is a very nice, straightforward, computational way of calculating the inverse of a matrix. And if you're already used to row reduction, or if you already have a computer algorithm for doing row reduction, this is a great way of calculating the inverse of a matrix. But unfortunately, this is a very algorithmic way of calculating the inverse of a matrix. What if we wanted to work mathematically with the inverse of the matrix? What if we wanted a formula for the inverse of a matrix? Well, it turns out that there is a formula. It's a fairly nice one. And this formula comes out of what's called Kramer's rule. So to get started, I'd like to uh, actually write out the formula for the inverse of a two by two matrix. So we see that the inverse of a matrix, we have to calculate one over the determinant of that matrix and then multiply it by some scrambled version of the original matrix where we've added in some minus signs in what winds up being a checkerboard pattern. So it's worth taking a moment to pause and note something here. If we take a matrix and multiply it by some constant, uh, that's actually going to multiply the determinant by that constant to the power of the dimension that we're in. Uh, one way of thinking of this is you could think of this as multiplying by the matrix of the identity matrix times this determinant. And now it's a little bit more obvious that the determinant of this whole product it's going to be the determinant of this matrix times the determinant of this matrix, and the determinant of this matrix here is going to be 1 over the determinant of the original matrix uh, squared. So that's an important thing to note. It'll come up uh, again later in this video. Uh, and uh, generally speaking, uh, it's just uh, the constant to the power of the number of dimensions that you have. And I'll make a separate video about how to calculate determinants, because there's lots of ways of doing that as well. So I'd actually like to make a slight modification to this formula up here and explain to you what's going on. So I'm actually going to transpose this matrix and then tell you to transpose it back. Uh, and what's going on is that the entries of this matrix are gotten by getting rid of, so this entry here is gotten by getting rid of the first row and the first column of this original matrix, and that's going to leave us just this entry here. This entry here, we get rid of the first row and the second column, that's going to leave us C, and then of course we have this plus or minus checkerboard pattern, so we get minus C. This B here, we get rid of the second row and the first column, and we're left with B, and uh, again for this A here uh, as well. And this pattern continues when we go into higher dimensions. It's just that when we get rid of, say we get rid of the first row and the first column, in higher dimensions we're going to be left by, uh, with a matrix. And uh, uh, in three dimensions we're left with a 2 by 2 matrix, in four dimensions we're left with a 3 by 3 matrix, uh, and we just have to take the determinant of that matrix. This is called a cofactor. So uh, let's actually apply this rule to calculate the determinant of uh, the matrix that we did in the previous example, uh, and I'll let you kind of fill in the gaps uh, for what this rule is. So again, we have to multiply by 1 over the determinant. To take the determinant of this matrix, there's various ways of doing it. Let me just tell you that the determinant of this matrix here is 7. So I'm going to multiply the whole thing by 1 7th. And then I'm going to multiply by the following matrix. So for this top left entry, I'm going to get rid of the first row and the first column. And I'm left with this matrix here. For this next entry, I get rid of the first row and the second column, and I'm left with 1700. Zero, zero. And don't forget the minus sign because there's going to be a checkerboard of plus and minus signs. And then this entry here, I'm getting rid of the first row and the third column, so I'm left with 100, zero, zero, negative 1. 
uh, this entry, I get rid of the second row and the first column, so I get 4, 0, negative 1, 0. I have to put a minus sign because of the checkerboard of plus and minus signs, and so on and so forth. And then, of course, we have to remember to transpose our matrix when we're done. Uh, and so this matrix here, without the coefficient out front and without the transpose, this is called the cofactor matrix. And if we take the transpose, we get what's called the adjugate matrix. And then finally, when we multiply by 1 over the determinant of the original matrix, we get the inverse matrix to the original matrix. And I'll let you go ahead and calculate these determinants because there are so many zeros. It's actually fairly straightforward to calculate them. Don't forget to take the transpose and then divide by 7, and you'll wind up getting uh, the same inverse matrix that we had uh, in the previous um, uh, calculation. So this is really nice. It gives us an explicit formula for the inverse of a matrix. And again, it's called Kramer's rule. So there are tons of ways of calculating inverse matrices. Uh, there's a really cool one involving Newton's method, for instance. Uh, but the last uh, technique that I'd like to talk about in this video is using the Cayley-Hamilton theorem. So the Cayley-Hamilton theorem says that every matrix is going to be the root of what's called its characteristic polynomial. And in this case, the characteristic polynomial uh, can be calculated really simply. We just take the determinant of x times the identity matrix minus our original matrix. This gives us a polynomial, right? So this is going to uh, be a scalar type, but it's going to have a bunch of x's in it. So it's going to wind up being a polynomial when we do the calculation. So for instance, if we wanted to take the determinant of this matrix for the same matrix that we've been doing this example with, we're taking the determinant. Note the x is along the diagonal, and also we've turned all of the entries negative because we're subtracting m. And this determinant actually isn't that bad to calculate. There's still a couple of zeros we can take advantage of, uh, and it's, it's, not, it's not too bad of a calculation to do. And we wind up getting x cubed minus x squared plus 3x minus 7. And so what that means is that our original matrix M, this specific matrix that we're working out for this specific example, uh, satisfies that m cubed minus m squared plus 3m minus 7 times the identity is equal to the zero matrix, the matrix whose entries are all zero. And what we can do is we can take advantage of this. And uh, let's rewrite this a little bit. We get that. Let's bring the 7i over to the other side. And then let's divide both sides by 7. And finally, let's factor out. We can factor out to the left or factor out to the right an m. And we get m times m squared over 7 minus m over 7 plus 3 7 times the identity matrix is going to be equal to the identity matrix. And so this is exactly what we're looking for, m times this particular matrix, which isn't going to be that difficult to calculate. We just have to square our original matrix and do some combinations. m times this matrix here gives us the identity matrix. And so this matrix here is the inverse of our original matrix m. So we just have to calculate this. And if you do that calculation, you wind up getting exactly the same inverse matrix for all of the examples that we've been doing previously. The inverse is, of course, unique. And something actually kind of interesting happens uh, if we wind up uh, uh, trying this process uh, without uh, an invertible matrix. So uh, what's worth noting is that this entry here is what happens if we plug in x equals 0 into this original formula. So we get the determinant of negative 1 times m. And of course, if you multiply a matrix by a constant, in this case negative 1, you're multiplying the determinant by negative 1 to the power of the number of dimensions there are. In this case, 3. So this here is negative 
the determinant because this is what we get when we plug in x equals zero, we get the constant term. And so it's going to be negative, the determinant of the original matrix. But what if the determinant of the original matrix is zero? What if we got something like this for our characteristic polynomial? Well, let me show you what that would look like. We would then know, let's, let's erase this. We would then know that m cubed minus m squared plus 3m would be equal to the zero matrix. And then let's factor out an m from this formula here, either to the left or to the right. It works out the same way, which is really kind of neat. We get that m times this matrix here, which we can calculate just as easily, uh, gives us zero. So if we start off with a matrix that isn't invertible, we wind up getting a witness to the fact that that original matrix is a zero divisor something that we can multiply m by on either side because we could have factored the m out on the other side, something that we can multiply m by on either side to wind up getting the zero matrix. So even though uh, our original matrix uh, in this hypothetical didn't have an inverse, uh, if we tried applying this technique, it would wind up giving us something still kind of interesting it's a matrix that when we multiply by m, we wind up getting the zero matrix. So that's kind of a, a cool duality that we get uh, for the invertible and non-invertible matrix out of this Cayley-Hamilton theorem process. So those are the three techniques that I wanted to talk about in this video. There are, of course, plenty of other ways of calculating the inverse of a matrix, and I encourage you to look at all of them. I'll link the Wikipedia article down below. And remember, while it's useful to know one way of calculating the inverse of, of a matrix and to know one way of working with invertible matrices, uh, it's actually really powerful to have a wide array of tools that you can use to approach any sort of problem. Even if it's as simple as calculating the inverse of a particular matrix, that matrix, um, it, it might be easier to apply one of these techniques over the others just because of the way the original matrix is set up. But if you're dealing with problem solving involving matrices, involving inverse matrices, well, then it's really important to have a wide array of tools at your disposal for solving these problems. So thanks for watching this video, and I hope to see you in a future video.